So, um, thank you very much to all. We are starting now our session about mathematics and physics. At first sight, it seems that mathematics and physics have little to do with the major issue of this conference, namely consciousness, because mathematics and physics are supposed to be very abstract sciences, whereas consciousness is the most concrete, the most present thing that we have. Yet, the implications of these so-called exact sciences for the problem of consciousness are very many. First of all, mathematics and physics are elaborated, obviously, by conscious human beings. And it's quite important to evaluate the mark of this origin on the structure and contents of these sciences. Secondly, if physics can claim to be a faithful representation of reality, then it's natural to expect that it will bring light on a crucial aspect of reality, such as consciousness. This is an implication of the so-called realist philosophy of physics. It's not an implication of physics by itself. It's an implication of a certain philosophical interpretation or reading of physics. But if physics, according to another philosophy, is less than a representation of reality, if it is only a sophisticated way, a sophisticated method for betting about the outcome of our experimental or technological actions, then it gives us a very different lesson about consciousness. Physics here, in that case, in that philosophical reading, suggests that consciousness should be taken as a presupposition rather than an object of physics. But physics and mathematics can also provide us with other things. They can provide models of the brain functioning that are more elaborate than those of biology and therefore re renew our understanding of the correlation between neural processes and mental processes. They can also provide more directly models of mind processes which can be compared to our experience of them while we are most attentive to them, namely during yoga or meditation. These are some of the topics which will be addressed during this rich afternoon session and therefore now I call our first speaker, uh, Ralph Abraham, uh, who is the founder of the Visual Mathematical Project at the University of California at Santa Cruz. Thank you, Ralph. When the saints, oh, when the saints, oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. This is uh, it's called a spiritual, so-called spiritual, the 100% American equivalent of a budgeon. And this per particular one is calling in the saints, all the Guruji's, the Babaji's, the Rishi's, and so on, to come in and attend to us. And I particularly want to call the entities of all planes who had any responsibility in bringing me here today so that I can uh, thank them from the bottom of my heart as this uh, being here in this uh, time and place and uh, event experience phenomenon. It's uh, is very important to me and to my life. So as far as uh, consciousness, cognition, and culture is concerned, I am a mathematician and no more. And so I'll be addressing uh, some relevance, I hope, to mathematical consciousness, mathematical uh, cognition, or perception, or discovery, and a mathematical culture. Now, mathematics and mysticism are, both of them, very large domains. Uh, so we may have a lot to do, but uh, don't worry. My intention is a kind of first-person report on my life of some 60 years or more on the 
the fractal boundary between mathematics and mysticism. So in, as far as mathematics is concerned, I should uh, just signal the small niche of this huge domain where I've had my personal experience over these 60 years. And this is in a relatively new branch of mathematics called dynamical systems theory, or also known as uh, global analysis. This was created by Poincaré, and so I am in the lineage, as it were, of uh, Poincaré, along with many other mathematicians today. Uh, this little branch, new branch of mathematics, includes uh, nonlinear dynamics, chaos theory, catastrophe theory, nonlinear oscillations, many other uh, specialties uh, spread over a large uh, area of the domain of mathematics. This is an image from my current research. I just uh, share with you because I have uh, the ambition or the intention to engage art, artists and uh, uh, art, artistic technicians in the research of mathematics. As far as chaos theory is concerned, universities have largely dropped it at the moment, although in my, my view, of course, as a specialist of chaos theory, I think that it's extremely important and it should be studied in every university, math department, and so on. But it's not, so my intention then to get some research done uh, promptly in this uh, important frontier of chaos theory is to draft artists in to help me in the research. In this connection, I give a course every year at my University of California, Santa Cruz called Chaos, Fractals, and the Arts. And the students in this course will learn something of the mathematics, something of the computer science, and something of the art of uh, chaos theory. So, so in the upcoming instance of this course, starting in about three weeks, this image will be the, the starting point. As far as mysticism, of course, the, this is an even larger domain, especially considering the fact that it's not even defined. Uh, but here again, I can signal out just the small niche in which I have had my personal experience over these years. First of all, there's a guru called the girl lines, where I had um, an affair with a guru in the Himalayan foothills uh, more than 40 years ago, which uh, changed the direction of my career and has been very important to me ever since. And uh, the other domains in uh, the mystical direction uh, <clears throat> that have affected me equally are uh, psychedelics, where I had an experimental period lasting about five years, but also many years ago, and uh, meditation, which has been my lifelong partner since the age of 14, and uh, divination, which I took up in the 1960s, particularly astrology, and the consultation with the I Ching. So somehow all of these lines of mysticism are, are related and have impacted my research work in mathematics and vice versa. Uh, as far as vice versa is concerned, one of my hobbies is using mathematics to assist in uh, understanding, uh, communicating um, the cosmological models of the, all the ancient traditions. So I uh, want to talk about my personal experience of this fractal frontier in uh, two parts. And uh, first I'll um, talk about this uh, work on the quantum vacuum, which is a joint project I've undertaken with your professor, Shishi Roy. It's all his fault. <clears throat> First of all, I've been trying to trace back, and I'm probably not done, and many of you here uh, can help me trace back the uh, genesis of the idea of associating the Akash or any uh, uh, idea of space in spiritual or, or scientific traditions with the quantum vacuum. 
Uh, as far as I've found so far, the earliest uh, I came across is this N.C. Panda uh, in his first book, 1995, called The Vibrating Universe. This attracted my attention right away because vibration is one of the main metaphors that I learned uh, during my stay in the Malian foothills. So he was primarily a scientist, but he seemed to be extremely knowledgeable, not only in uh, uh, physics, quantum mechanics, and so on, um, but also in the ancient traditions of the Vedic lore and the classical Sanskrit literature. So in this first book of 1995, he mentions a spand, which is the kind of vibration that uh, has particularly attracted my attention, and uh, the akash, and uh, then identifying the akash as uh, the quantum vacuum occurs toward the end of the book on page 342. Uh, the next step in my story is a, a paper by Requart and our Shishi Roy uh, is called this quantum space-time as a statistical geometry of fuzzy lumps and the connection with random metric spaces written in two, or published in 2001. So I, I would never have come across this paper except for the accident of my being invited to uh, ISI Calcutta where I was invited to give, give a talk, I forget about what, and uh, after that I met uh, Professor Rory and he told me about this work and I immediately saw that it fit into my research program. So that began our collaboration on this idea. And <coughs> It's a pretty difficult paper to read, I would say, but I'll just share with you the abstract. It's a little dim. Can you read that? Okay, so a uh, kind of pre-geometry consisting of a web of overlapping fuzzy lumps with interact with each other. And uh, graph theory is used to uh, analyze this web of overlapping fuzzy lumps. Our work together finally resulted in this book, Demystifying the Akash, Consciousness and the Quantum Vacuum. <laughs> Ambitious title and subtitle, and uh, what's inside is extremely uh, simple, I think, uh, easy to read and understand, and whether you would agree with the title or not, I'm not so sure. The illustration on the cover comes from a research project I did many years earlier in the simulation of Rupert Sheldrake's idea of morphic resonance. So along the line of uh, Punda, about the identification of the Akash and the quantum vacuum, there are a couple other authors, I'm not sure if they're earlier or later, who are relevant. One is uh, Irvin Laszlo, who has a series of books on the Akash and the Akashic field, I think he calls it. And the other is Rupert Sheldrake, noted biologist of the United Kingdom, who had spent uh, seven years in South India in the ashram of Father Bede Griffiths, the Christian ashram in Tamil Nadu. And during his time there, uh, he wrote this book about morphic resonance, in which it seemed to me he had tried to uh, re-express what he had learned of the Hindu tradition and sacred science in a language that uh, scientists of the Western world could uh, understand. So nothing unnatural is presented. It all looks like, like science, he, even though he became very controversial. So I met him in 1982 and I, I loved his ideas and we had this uh, Indian connection in common. So I tried to help him popularize his work by creating a kind of a documentary film, including a computer graphic simulation of his morphic field. And uh, this is just one of the images at that time in the um, mid-1980s. Our computer graphic equipment was a, a very primitive. We used a very expensive silicon graphics workstation and uh, program these graphic images entirely in the C programming language and the uh, OpenGL um, vocabulary of three-dimensional graphics. Um, I'm not going to drag you through any part of the book, uh, but here's what it says. I think this is on the back cover. 
This book sets out to prove, <laughs> this is modest, to prove the compatibility of the scientific outlook and the spiritual non-duality of India. Um, the mathematical model of Requiert and Roy is uh, atomistic. It's a discrete model. It consists of a finite number of points, uh, some of which are connected by a directed link, and both the points, or the nodes, and the links carry a certain weight and number, and these uh, change as time advances in very tiny uh, steps according to a uh, rule, which is supposed to relate to the actual quantum physics of the quantum vacuum, I guess. Um, but I just adopted it for uh, the Akash and uh, taking over the same rule, but of course uh, we would not really have a useful model unless we knew the, the rules. It would be like approaching uh, the, the theory of general relativity without having the Einstein equation. We're just saying, well, the, we know there could be some equation that if we put it in there we'd get some interesting results. Uh, but it is computable. It's computable if you've got a fast enough computer or you're willing to wait a long time. So that's just uh, background. I'm not trying to sell you the book. Although there is a recent review of the book, which I think is more informative than the book itself. <laughs> so in a few pages, uh, you could get an idea about the subject better than mine. Now about math cognition, here, of course, is where I have my primary uh, personal experience of uh, mathematics. And in order to explain my understanding of my own personal process of mathematical discovery, I want to refer to some maps of consciousness. So here I've made a little uh, chronology <coughs> of gradually increasing uh, complexity uh, the shamanic religion, of course, the Ur religion, the first one and only, <coughs> uh, evidenced in the painted caves in the south of France and so on. Three levels, that's the ordinary reality, and a level uh, downstairs, that's the basement, and then upstairs on the first floor. Uh, then in uh, the Sanskrit literature, you have the Panchakosh, and uh, I think that this is uh, probably the source of Plato's model with his four levels, which I, of course, became familiar with uh, long before I learned of the others. Uh, for Plato, the top level, he called it the good. So he, like many of us, trying to avoid the word God, he called it the good, and then you have the intellectual sphere, and this is where all his, Plato's famous ideas are stored in a gigantic uh, closet. Uh, full of blueprints for things that could uh, perhaps be materialized in ordinary reality downstairs. And then in Kashmiri Shaivism, you've got the probably the ultimate uh, interpolation of additional levels, um, but I like it because it is uh, very complete. It starts at the top with uh, the good, basically, but this is called Shiva. There's Shiva and Shakti, and then as you go down, you get more and more levels of denser and denser, and the different levels are supposed to be coupled together by something like morphic resonance, which in the literature of Kashmiri Shaivism is called spund. And um, after you get down a ways, then uh, you, you come to a group of levels that are called maya, which are, of course, opaque to ordinary humans. So if you're downstairs, you can look up, you can't see the whole of the sky. There's this cloud layer called maya, and then, after some more levels of uh, space and time are defined, and then you get the individual consciousness as a kind of a, a drops of rain in a, in a huge cloud, which is cosmic consciousness, you see. So there's a transition to the individual level, and then finally uh, down lower, you have the uh, levels of the five senses and so on. So I'd like to uh, just specialize in one of these. I think this is the simplest one that uh, helps me to talk about my process of mathematical cognition. So these are the five kosh, and uh, at the top is the, the bliss level, and at the bottom the physical level. 
and then there's an energy level and a mind level and an intellect level, and these two particularly correspond, uh, or these four, leaving out this gray one here, the energy level, correspond to Plato's uh, five levels. So as far as mathematical perception is concerned, what is a math mathematical object or idea, or where is a mathematical object or idea? So uh, I, following Plato, and my own experience, I put a mathematical idea here on the intellectual level and uh, the mathematical object as perceived in mind, here in the mind level. And uh, th that's, that's all there is to it. In preparation for this meeting, this is one reason it's been so good for me to come here, is I, I had to uh, promise a title in abstract um, far in advance. So I, I wrote a paper that I thought would be appropriate and it was called Math and Mysticism. And then uh, as time went on during the summer, I realized that it was totally inappropriate, inappropriate for this uh, conference, although my ideas kind of fit theoretical way. It wasn't something that I could uh, really present here. So I wrote another one in which I recast my personal experience uh, in uh, spread it over the whole history of mathematics and selecting from the whole history of mathematics, certain uh, very significant mathematicians like uh, Kepler and uh, Newton and, and so on, that I knew had um, um, mystical input to their creative work. And uh, then I decided that one was too boring. So in, in the end, I wrote four uh, papers. They're all posted on my website. And what I'm presenting today is just uh, skimming a couple of ideas from each one. So in case, uh, in the unlikely case, anybody was interested in like a, a reference or how to spell a word or a name or anything like that, the dates, all the details can be found in these uh, articles that are posted on my personal website. So here's the, uh, the first actual something here. I claim that we have a mathematical object and uh, a mathematical idea, and uh, then we have the perception of it, and that these uh, to the mathematical object in the intellectual sphere and its representation in mind are connected by some kind of resonance process, like spun or morphic resonance. And I've made it uh, bi-directional here, giving kind of a nod to the phenomenology of uh, Francisco Varela and so on. So if we had, a, let us say a cube would be a typical mathematical idea, then there's the idea up here and then there's my mental image I get of a cube when you tell me cube and then this image will pop up in my mind and uh, on the other hand if I had a physical cube, an approximate cube made out of, uh, carved out of wood, then uh, that would be uh, way down here. So the, the first thing, this is a little subtle, I'm suggesting that the mathematical cognition is in no way related to the ordinary visual process involving the retina, the optic nerve, and the visual cortex, etc. So here's the same picture with the perception of the block of wood, cubical block of wood uh, put in. So we end up with the uh, visual process. It's also a kind of a resonance, uh, let us say, that could be described in the language of neurophysiology. And from the cube, I, uh, the wooden cube, I also get a mental image of a cube. So what I'm suggesting here is that these two perceptual processes are uh, totally or almost totally independent. And uh, that's called the disjunctive theory, the disjunctive model in the uh, theory of hallucinations, which began with uh, Descartes. And for most of the history of uh, this theory of hallucination, the uh, two kinds of visions, hallucinatory and, and real uh, visual perception, were identified. Nobody questioned that until relatively recently. And that uh, recent questioning was very useful uh, to me because it gave a kind of a theoretical or pseudoscientific 
justification for the way that I had been understanding my own experience of uh, mathematical vision or perception. So, uh, summarizing the four papers, uh, here's all really I have to say. I think that mathematical cognition is a form of meditation. So, uh, as I started my mathematical career, I, I began meditating. I didn't didn't know it as meditation, but now I could see, having uh, learned uh, several schools of meditation, uh, that as a matter of fact, doing uh, work, doing research on the mathematical frontier requires a kind of a med meditation, either a focused meditation or an insight meditation. Uh, furthermore, the practice of ordinary meditation is very helpful for doing mathematical work. It, uh, it increases the clarity of mathematical vision. It just, I don't know why, uh, although I've got quite a few ideas from the talks here today. Furthermore, on the basis of personal experience, and I think I'm not the only one to make this report, mathematical cognition is greatly furthered uh, by psychedelics. That is to say, if you have a successful psychedelic experience once, then your mathematical perception will be improved forever. And uh, finally, the point that I just made on the diagram, that mathematical cognition and ordinary vision are completely disjunct, if I may borrow that word from the disjunctive theory of hallucinations. So I suppose <coughs> uh, that these imaging processes are kind of similar or parallel processes and shouldn't be identified, but the study of one could help uh, understand another. So regular vision, mathematical vision, I've talked about those, a psychedelic vision, well, um, you probably have heard that most uh, psychedelics, not all, uh, produce amazing visualizations. And uh, the uh, abstract animation that I was showed, as you may have seen on the screen while you were coming in, is uh, an artwork by a computer graphic artist named uh, Spot, S-P-O-T. It's called Electric Sheep, inspired by a book uh, called do androids dream of electric sheep is a question, is the title of one of the most famous books by our greatest American author, Philip K. Dick. And uh, so Spot was inspired by chaos theory and by Philip K. Dick to produce an artwork. Now there are thousands of these uh, abstract animations, animations, they last about four minutes and they are extremely reminiscent of psychedelic visions, and uh, that is why I start all of my lectures, each and every one, by showing the, one of these uh, artworks of, of Spot. Uh, in meditation, you have visions, and of course there are many artistic representations of these visions in the literature of all tr traditions. Uh, the dream images also have been drawn, and of course hallucinations, a word that covers a host of different phenomena. I think they're similar processes, but they shouldn't be identified in my experience. So here's uh, the, the earliest example I've been able to find of the disjunctive theory of hallucination is due to Baudelaire in uh, 1857. Baudelaire was one of these uh, writers who uh, wrote kind of prose poetry so a very artistic fellow whose work was inspired by a very serious addiction to hashish, uh, this charis, and uh, opium. So besides all his artistic works, he wrote uh, something like I'm trying to do now to give a first-person account of my uh, artistic process. He said, when I speak of hallucinations, the word must not be taken in its strictest sense. A very important shade of difference distinguishes pure hallucination, such as doctors have often, uh, often have occasion to study, uh, distinguish from the hallucination, or rather of the misinterpretation of the senses which arises in the mental state caused by the hashish. 
So in uh, the theory of hallucination, I've uh, included him in the usual list uh, as, 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 as a, a little known stranger uh, among the milestones of the theory of hallucination with uh, Plato, of course, with his dream in the cave in the Republic and, and uh, Descartes' famous uh, dream, which was uh, caused a sensation in philosophy that still hasn't subsided, and then Baudelaire, which I've uh, interpolated into this list, and of course Poincaré in 1904. Now, not Poincaré, how many people have heard of Poincaré? Yeah, oh, well, quite a lot. So Poincaré was arguably the greatest mathematician of all time so far. And uh, um, he, uh, I think his, the second contender is Euler. So in terms of the rate of production, Poincaré is about equal to two Eulers. And uh, I'm, I'm equivalent to 0 0.001 Euler. Uh, but different from every other prolific mathematician, Poincaré, because I'm in, I'm in his line, so my estimate of his importance in the history of mathematics might be slightly t tainted. Uh, but among, uniquely among them all, he wrote down, as I'm trying to say now something but not much better, he wrote down uh, an account of his process of mathematical discovery, accepting, he called it mathematical creation. So there's a kind of difference of opinion there between me and Poincaré, uh, because I agree with Plato that mathematical objects are discovered, but uh, Poincaré thought that he was actually inventing all these things, which he, he might be right. I can't prove which idea is, is correct. Maybe this uh, uh, attains to the word reality in the description of this session. <laughs> reality, physics, and mathematics. So this, this is what he said. He described uh, a process. I, I'd go on in detail about it, except we've seen it uh, this, this morning um, uh, in, 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 in the talk of uh, Rajan on the creative process, and then it was uh, attributed to somebody else, I think a later writer, but this is exactly what Poincaré said. You do a whole lot of work struggling with concepts and you have an idea of what you want to do and you just can't do it. You get all frustrated and then you set it aside. Uh, then you go on a picnic with the children, have lunch, and, and then uh, later on you come back and, and, uh, and maybe you go to sleep and in the middle of the night you wake up and you have an idea. So uh, he identified uh, the unconscious. He had another name for it. Uh, but the unconscious was doing the work with a manipulation of the mathematical ideas that had been uh, ingested, as it were, uh, before the picnic. And uh, the unconscious like reassembles these uh, blocks in different constructions and trying to make something and figures out something and then there is a uh, uh, illumination, it's called, as uh, in, into the conscious mind, the product of the unconscious work pops out all done. He, he tells a story when he, he, he was going on the bus, when he put his, put his foot on the bus, the whole thing came to him. The theorem, the proof, the way of presenting it, he was so sure it was right. He just stepped right onto the bus and went on to a picnic. And uh, later on, he wrote it all down. So he was, had so many creative experiences of this sort. Uh, and he analyzed them so well, and he came up with this theory, which is more or less, uh, the theory of creativity that we have today. So uh, <clears throat> that's the story I wanted to tell you. Here are some references uh, that I've mentioned. More details can be found in my literature. And uh, here's my website. If you go to this website, and there's a long menu, and if you click on articles, then you will find uh, these numbered articles, uh, manuscript number 144 and so on, in uh, chronological order. So there you have it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ralph. So I will uh, call uh, Professor Hank Barenrecht, who is um,
who is an Emeritus Professor of Foundations of Mathematics and Computer Science at Radboud University, Nijmegen, um, the Netherlands. To thank the organizers for inviting me at this symposium. It's my third trip to Bangalore. But the other ones were in the 90s. I changed the title of my talk, and it's now Axiomatizing Consciousness with Applications. And I will be starting from the other side of the explanatory gap that we discussed yesterday. I will stand on the side of consciousness and not on the side of the brain and its electric signals. And the talk is inspired by oral and written vipassana tradition, personal vipassana practice, science, phenomenology, including mathematics. And I present two models, namely the Abhidhamma model, an ancient Indian model, and then an extension, the hybrid Turing model. The German monk Nyana Ponika, who lived in Sri Lanka for a long part of his life, he emphasized that the Abhidhamma is not a fixed text, text that should be considered as finished, but it's more something like physics that one can extend. So in that realm, um, we can do these things. And the applications are, are several ones, so, but let me just go on. Evolution has produced swimming dolphins, they do it very well, and flying swifts, they do it very well. But it is very improbable that genetic evolution produces a being playing Bela Bartok's sonata for violin solo. When it was composed in 1944, only Yehudi Menuhin could play it and nobody else. So this is too difficult to produce a, a, a person who can play this. But Nowadays, at a good conservatory, good students can play it, and uh, every Gedlis does it. So, how did he do it? He was not born. Um, to play this, but he had a mental program that was the score from which he could learn it, and it was emphasized this morning, you have to practice a lot in order to be able to play this. So where does the score come from? Well, that comes from the evolution of musical memes. Memes is the evolution of ideas that live in, live in libraries, and more than 200 years before, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach um, made also a shakona, and we can hear that it's in the same style, so to speak. same basic rhythm, the same kind of chords. So this is definitely an evolution of memes. And they're concerned with learning. On the other hand, we have unlearning, deconditioning. So all living beings are conditioned, like flying insects, they orient themselves towards a light source, and if this source is infinitely distant, they fly straight, so it's an adaptive um, conditioning. But this becomes dramatic from the moment that Homo sapiens invented fire, because if you have a candle in the garden, the insects fly into the candle. They take a constant angle, and for an infinite distant thing, you go straight, but for the finitely distant candle, you go in a spiral into the candle. Now, higher insects have learned to avoid candles, but this requires many generations. 
Now, Homo sapiens has a trump card, namely mindfulness, with which you can learn to decondition within a lifetime. And this brings flexibility and wisdom into its mind states. And this is quite important because mind states have three powerful effects, namely phenomenological effects, so in your lived experience, can be joyful or suffering, behavioral, in the lived actions, your actions can be wholesome or unwholesome, and neurophysiological in your body. Your body can be healthy and ill. And recent research into meditation shows that it diminishes visits to either the psychiatrist, the police, or the doctor. So on all these three levels, there are improvements. What I will do is to give an axiomatization of consciousness. And yesterday and the day before yesterday, it was said that consciousness doesn't have a good definition. <clears throat> what is nice about axiomatizations that you do not need to give a definition. Aristotle described the method of uh, axiomatization. And he said, well, there are concepts, and a concept you can define from another concept, from another concept. But in order to prevent an infinite regress, you have to start with so-called primitive concepts that are not defined. Similarly, the properties of the objects that you speak about can be proved, and you prove it from earlier proven properties, from earlier ones. But in order to prevent an infinite regress, you have to start somewhere, and these are the axioms. And then Hilbert, 2,000 years later, mentioned, yes, the, um, I don't care what the point is or what the line is, but the only thing what I care about is that through two different points, there is an exactly one straight line. So the um, axioms form an implicit definition of the primitive terms. Still, we want to know more or less what consciousness is in order to have some intuition, and this comes here. So in the first um, picture, I see a monkey, and then I see a nut and a an, um, cat. So this is the stream of consciousness. But in the second line, um, it is indicated that the stream of consciousness is not only visual. In the second one, we also have an auditive um, object for our consciousness and a an th thinking object for our consciousness, I doubt, hence I am. We discussed this yesterday. In the third line, we see that um, all those objects of our consciousness give rise to actions. So I see the monkey, then I walk on and see a nut, walk on and see a cat. So A1, A2, and A3 are actions that we do when we have seen certain objects. But this model is too limited. This is the limited description of the behaviorist that try to understand psychology by describing um, stimulus response. And as already mentioned on the first day, um, this is definitely wrong because one can give an animal or homo sapiens at one moment an input and the reaction will be this and at another moment the reaction will be that. So this is not correct. We need something more. We need a state. And in this uh, intuitive drawing, the three pictures that I had before come with the state, let's say in you or in me, doesn't matter, a state in mind. So if you're afraid of gorillas, then that's the way to see a gorilla. So it's 
I1 is the gorilla, comes together with S1, state 1, which is fear. Then you walk on, maybe you flee away, and you come to a party, you see I2, nuts, and S2, state 2, maybe greed, because you like to eat. Then you see the cat, I3, S3 is a state, and gives you joy, this little cat. Now, states are quite complex and too complex to be measured or to be computed. But you can reason with states. Now, in the kinetic theory of gases, a state is a factor in a vector space of dimension 6 times 10 to the 23rd. 10 to the 23rd is the number of Avogadro, the number of molecules in a certain unit of gas. And six is that for every molecule, they have a space coordinates, three space coordinates, and three speed coordinates. Again, this is not something to be measured, but something to be reasoned about. And the kinetic theory of gases was successful to predict the laws of thermodynamics. Yeah, then I, I put this picture here because in the Abhidhamma, the old uh, Buddhist psychology, 250 before Christ. Basically, they discuss this, how the body-mind system has, gets input from the world, gets output towards the world, and then there is a uh, mind part and a body part. So this picture was on the slides um, before, I think yesterday morning. What's important here is that rupa, um, matter needs to be interpreted phenomenologically. So I touch this, let's call it table, I touch it and it exists in my, um, or better, in consciousness. There is a feeling about it. We are not speaking about the objective um, table, das Ding an sich, but we are speaking about the phenomenological uh, part. And the Abhidhamma is very clear that when they speak about rupa, body, they speak about perceived, um, perceived matter. Okay, now let's start going towards the axiomatization. First, a remark by Feynman that the most essential fact of physics is that against appearances, matter is discrete, consisting of atoms or molecules discrete in space. Look, it feels continuous, this piece of matter, but if we enlarge it well enough, there are small discrete um, things. And here, there is um, salt consisting of several salt molecules, and here is one oxytocin molecule that we discussed, that we heard about this morning. In the same way, the Abhidhamma says that the essence of consciousness is, or of psychology is that consciousness is not continuous against appearances. Um, it is discrete. Consciousness consists of flashes of consciousness moments. Now, this can be observed in meditation, but it can also be proved at the other side of the bridge uh, in brain research. And for one thing, the action potential is discrete. You may say, well, there are so many action potential, maybe they average out to something continuous, but here is some, uh, are the mental atoms of Lehmann. He made one of the first maps, EEG maps, and he noticed that every about 100 milliseconds, there is a mountainous area that's more or less fixed, and then there's a sudden change. He also observed that in schizophrenics, the uh, duration of a mental atom is shorter, and he could distinguish four different types of atoms, and in schizophrenics, the order is different. And um, one of the last things he did is that um, in meditators, the duration of the mental atoms are longer than 100 milliseconds. 
Then there is the work of Van Rullen about the wagon wheel illusion. Maybe you have seen a movie and you see a locomotive going into speed and then suddenly it seems as if the wheel is going the other way. And the reason is that when the wheel is like that, in the next picture frame it's there and next it's there. After the train is getting speed, first it's here and then the next one it's there, so it seems that it has been running backwards. And this can be observed under uh, full sunlight uh, with the human eye. So this points also to discretization of perception. So the first approximation of the Abhidhamma model is that there are a sequence of chetas, so the consciousness flesh is called a cheta or cheta, and they go in time. Let's enlarge a cheta. Um, they have two aspects. They are intentional, as the philosophers say, namely they are directed to an object. They are conscious of something. And secondly, they, are, um, they have a coloring, also called state. So, <clears throat> I was trying to get. So you can see this object, that's the content of your consciousness, but you can see it with happiness, if you happen to be happy, or if for some reason you are irritated, you can see the same object with irritation. So it's very important that there are these two aspects. And the objects, they come from our five senses, our five physical senses, and our mind sense, the thoughts, but later we will see more objects. And there are numberless of them. There are numberless objects. States, well, they are something like emotions, like aversion, desire, but also other things that usually are not called emotions, like concentration or restlessness. They are definitely a mind state, and they influence how you are, but they uh, are not among the usual emotions. In this review paper, um, we gave, we collected um, evidence that in the cerebrospinal fluid of the uh, brain, so I'm going to the other side of the bridge now, of the non-existing bridge, I have to say, um, and the chemical milieu of the uh, cerebrospinal fluid has a definite influence on the mind state, on the behavioral state of the animal, because this was animal research. And that, that fits because if we are angry, and if that's implemented by a chemical milieu in the cerebrospinal fluid, then we understand that for at least 10 minutes we remain somewhat angry. Or on the other hand, if we are happy, we also remain happy for 10 minutes because it has to dissipate and it doesn't go so quickly away. Now in the Abhidhamma they distinguish 89 types of consciousness. Actually there are more, but the 89 are relevant for the soteriological effect we discussed. Well, <clears throat> Geshe Dorje mentioned the first day, well, we should be concerned about the diminishing of suffering and the diminishing of hatred. And also, in Professor Lysenko's talk yesterday, the soteriological effect was mentioned. And we can restrict to 89 uh, types of consciousness because they play a role in the purification. So they are divided in three planes. The sensual plane, that's the plane of our daily life experience. That sounds good. Well, it sounds good, but it's not always good because the pleasurable things are there. But what is pleasurable is not always wholesome. Sometimes something can be very pleasurable, like opium, but if you eat it, it seems, then you want more, and then you are into troubles. 
Um, so we also cannot say that the pleasurable things are unwholesome. In Holland we have many Calvinists and they think that the pleasure is unwholesome and the unpleasure is wholesome. No, that's also not correct. Pleasure and wholesome, they overlap. And we have to skillfully make use of that. Now, among the unwholesome, there are eight ones based on desire, two on hatred and two on ignorance. That's good news. Only two, hatred fits in only two m mind states. Only two. The bad news is that they occur a lot. No. The next uh, lower, well, it doesn't matter, there is no meaning in lower, but the next uh, plane is the sublime plane, and that's the plane of the mystic. Well, I'm pointing here because the previous speaker um, had the mystic experience in his talk. So um, rapture and joy belong to states that can be reached through meditation. Then the final plane is the supramundane plane, and supramundane doesn't mean supranatural, but it is the plane in which you change lineage. If you have one cheta um, in, of that plane, you um, eliminate some of the unwholesome states. And enlightenment is exactly defined in the Abhidharma it's the elimination of unwholesome states. Okay. Like the atoms in physics have several levels, namely you have an atom and you have elementary, elementary particles. Also here, the chetas uh, have parts. So <clears throat> every cheta may be seen as a cocktail of mental factors. You can also so-called chetasikas, and you can call them sub-states. Now, let's see how should we define or how should we consider a sub-state. A state is a readiness to act. And in that definition, it's a bit difficult to imagine what is a sub-state. But you can approximate a state by a list of factor, a factor of parameters that hold, so your blood pressure is so much, your oxytocin level is so much, etc., etc. And um, if you just consider these, they are the substates. More easy, uh, we have the weather, the state of the weather, for that you would need to know the temperature, the pressure, and the humidity everywhere. Okay, we never can uh, measure that, but it's already interesting to know if the weather has the uh, substate of being sunny or being rainy. So those are the substates that are relevant. And in the Abhidhamma, 52 chitasikas are mentioned, substates. And they can be listed in a uh, two by three matrix. On the left, we have unwholesome states, like shamelessness. In fact, uh, one of the talks this morning was about shamelessness. Um, if you do gruesome things without having shame, that, um, that played a role um, and in, in the punishment uh, lecture. In the middle, you have variable um, substates, like feeling, feeling can be pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. And remember, pleasant doesn't mean wholesome, and therefore it's variable there. Now on the right, you have the beautiful, or you can also say wholesome uh, states, substates, like mindfulness, equanimity. Ah yes, uh, the, this morning we heard a beautiful lecture with poetry. Um, uh, equanimity in uh, Pali is upeka, in Sanskrit upeksha, and the, uh, I think, is, is the poet here? That you can help. So that's a big uh, uh, difference. Now, there is 
a big important statement now, that's the last statement on the slide, namely that the red and the blue substates are mutually exclusive. Okay, you have to believe that. I've just given an uh, axiomatic approach. The people on the other side of the bridge will have to prove that. But this is very lucky that they are different because then if we practice mindfulness, we don't have the unwholesome states. And this is what is done in Vipassana meditation, uh, mainly mindfulness, which comes together with friendliness, if you have the right mindfulness, that is practice. In the Tibetan practice, they go one step further, they practice compassion, and uh, when you have compassion, you also automatically have mindfulness and friendliness, if you have the right compassion. So, here there is, we have some grips to practice uh, going towards the more wholesome mind states by continuously trying to be on the right side. Oh, I'm sorry, the colors didn't come. Well, a little bit, right? Um, the beautiful ones are blue and the unwholesome ones are, are red. Can you see them? The colors? Uh, I hardly can see them here. Now, there is one more um, level of um, consciousness stream, namely that sequence of mind states, and they call a, a street of mind states, a viti, they belong together. And here we see 17 viti, uh, and the input from the body is grouped as a 17 VT. And the first part, the black ones, um, they are related to the input, so-called resultant, because it depends on what you did before, what comes to you. And the orange ones are, uh, give the possibility for you to make some choice of behavior. And, and since consciousness is so strong, and if you have an intention to behave, um, this behavior will come up sooner or later, or at least with a higher probability. Now, <clears throat> uh, this 17 feet for input from the body is followed by three 12 feet from the mind, namely one so if you see something, you see this, then uh, you remember, oh yes, this is that and that. Uh, I've seen previous speakers play with this. You give it a name, oh, it is an, uh, I, I wouldn't know how to call it, but it is an, uh, a kind of beamer, let's say. And you know the meaning, you can project a red dot on the screen, so that's useful. And by the way, this, analysis of the cognitive process that starts with the 17 feet and then three 12 feet was not done in the Abhidhamma, but in later commentaries on the Abhidhamma. But what was in the Abhidhamma itself is that there is baseline consciousness. And that's very interesting. It states that most of our life, we are in baseline. People on the other side of the bridge may think uh, of our default uh, consciousness, which at least in the axiomatics of the Abhidhamma is there. So from default consciousness we get some perception, some, we see some light and some effects go. We see this group of four vitis, so the cognitive process, and then we go down into baseline. And then something else happens and we go down in baseline again. And this is now a, a big one, namely this is your whole life. It starts with your birth vita, uh, birth cheta, and the birth cheta is the one that you will have always in your baseline. And then you have many cognitive processes until, until we die, and that is the death cheta, which is the same one as the birth cheta, according to the axiomatics of the Abhidhamma. 
so what's interesting is that this baseline always has the same object and the same state. So that determines the personality of, uh, of the owner, so to speak, of, that, of those chetas. And even meditation cannot change this. But what meditation can change is the orange, um, the orange chetas there uh, that determine your action and your, basically your happiness and balancedness of the, re the coming ones. Okay, now summarizing the Abhidhamma model and giving um, applications, we can understand in this model what concentration means. Concentration means that we do not change our chetas too much. We keep them more or less constant. We understand what mindfulness is and kindness. They are chetasikas that belong to uh, the substates. Aha, uh -huh, but we haven't given an analysis yet of mindfulness, so that will come in the next model. But if we believe there, if we follow their axiomatization, it's good to have mindfulness. And um, another interesting application is the description of the mystical states. You start with the input, like before in the viti, but now we have a jhanic viti, a mystical mind state, in which the orange ones, first of all, they are um, positive, wholesome, but they go on. They don't dive back into your um, baseline. You stay there for a longer time, and this makes it a special experience. Then uh, purification that happened at the supramundane level is the eradication of unwholesome chetas groups of unwholesome chetikas are eliminated one by one. But still it's not said how this happens, so we have to go on. But a nice application of the Abhidhamma model was given by Zilber Berg and Dahane, a well-known neuroscientist. He said, this solves a problem of von Neumann. Von Neumann asked how Homo sapiens, that has biological noise, how can he or she make precise judgments. Well, by discretization. Remember, the old vinyl records had a lot of noise, but when we got the compact disc, there was much less noise. So discretization has a definite advantage. Then we also can understand the neurotic core of consciousness, as was discussed by Freud, because one cheta contains our desire, and the viti contains our cognition. So we may be interested in another person, but then the viti says, oh, but that person is married. Well, then there is a conflict. So this model has built in a conflict between uh, the it, the it and the superego. Uh, hello? Hello? Ah, it works again. The conflict between the id and the superego, let's say, the, your morality. Also, there is the psychotic core of consciousness that later psychoanalysts spoke about, can be visible here. Because in the viti, if um, they have to fit together, but if for some reason, maybe because you're restless, it doesn't work so well, your viti may be unstable and you start dissociation. Well, this can be glued either by greed or hatred. That's a very good glue. If you, uh, if you feel hatred, that feels good in some sense. And it glues you, but very dangerous. So don't do it. Uh, sadness can also glue. Or dilutions uh, can glue. So this is the model of the um, psychotic core explained from this Abhidhamma model. Okay, I have six essential slides, so I have to hurry up. Now, we can extend the Abhidhamma model to the uh, Turing machine. 
Here you see a Turing machine that has a tape. Binary counting program. I, I will discuss it. Um, it can write either a one or a zero, and it has above the lamp there, it has an eye that sees what symbol is written there. And depending on what is written there, it decides to move the tape to the left or the right and to erase or no, to erase or not and to write another symbol. And um, <clears throat> so I write it like I comma S, input and state, gives rise to an action and a new state. So basically what was in the intuition of the Abhidhamma model previously. Now, how is the transition determined by a finite table that determines the Turing machine? And here you see a finitely described Turing machine that reverses the content of a tape. You can imagine that you can do that easily. Present day computers essentially work like this, but the tape is replaced by an efficient random access memory. Now this Turing machine model can be applied also to agents, including homo sapiens. And in the Turing machine you just can go left and right, uh, or right uh, zero, right a one. But in humans, the zero and the one are replaced by sensory objects, so much more complex than in the Turing machine. Um, the actions going left or right is attention, uh, or the and that's the focusing actions, the environment actions, the writing can be seen as actions uh, or speech by Homo sapiens, and then the states are the states we encountered in the Abhidhamma model. Now, how are the transitions programmed? Well, not in a finite table as in the Turing machine, but by a neural net, and that's why. Homo sapiens is a hybrid Turing machine that the uh, uh, transitions are programmed by this neural net. But still the discreteness is there, which has the von Neumann, um, has the answer to the von Neumann question. Now a very important Turing machine is the universal Turing machine that can perform any task. And when Turing invented this in 1936, it was spectacular, but nowadays you all have one in your pocket, namely your smartphone, that can um, download apps. And when you have downloaded an app, your smartphone can act in a certain way or in another way. And what is the essence? The universal Turing machine is not very difficult. The essence is here, written here. You can write the state S as, as 1 plus S0 and then consider the S1 as input. So I comma S1 plus S0 becomes I plus S1, well, the code for S1, and still you have to state S0, which will interpret that code. Now, human culture of learning and de-learning, remember the first two slides, can be uh, interpreted as follows. Learning, you have a program, and you do it again and again, and then you have internalized it. If you play this sonata by Bartok, often enough, at some moment, well, I couldn't do it, but simpler things we can do. Um, if you repeat things enough, you get internalized, and that's the first transition. And deconditioning is taking something that is in your state, outside, and you consider it, and then you may decide not to use it. And here I give the typical example of mindfulness. In the beginning you, have, you see, you meet somebody, I, that's input, that's maybe another person, you're angry at that person. But when you apply mindfulness, your angriness can be seen. Maybe you use naming. Oh, there is angriness. At that moment you're not so angry anymore. But that's only an approximation of mindfulness. The real mindfulness is noting. You see your angriness. But seeing angriness is very different from being angriness. So this is the essence of mindfulness. Um, yeah, these two slides 
are about um, focusing and um, the global workspace theory, but I will skip that. I just want to mention that many uh, cognitive psychologists have described consciousness, and unfortunately, they all use a different word. So what one calls consciousness, the other calls subconsciousness, the other calls proto-consciousness, phenomenal consciousness, or pre-consciousness. And then when you do reflection or attention within that, you get the real thing, namely full consciousness or reflective consciousness, higher order consciousness, access consciousness, or just consciousness. So when you read the literature, be not confused by this confusing uh, difference in words. Uh, may I finish this? Um, because here is the path towards the end of suffering, and this is so important that... Um, so, mental development, that's another word for meditation, is to exercise concentration and insight. And using mindfulness. And when you do that, um, you can temporarily get rid of your angriness and other unwholesome states. With that increased concentration, you increase the resolution of your vision, of the process, and then you see, if you see enough of the chetas, you see that they follow each other with strict causality. In the beginning, you thought, oh, I gain more freedom by meditating because I don't need to be angry anymore. I don't need to be sad anymore. I can do that. But then you continue to meditate. You see that there is a strict causality. And that's awful. Then you are in the three characteristics that Professor Lysenko yesterday mentioned, the anicca, dukkha, anatta, constant change, suffering, and um, selflessness uncontrollability. And why is there suffering there? Because we have the wrong view on ourselves. We were thinking that we were the boss. We are thinking that we are in the middle of the universe and we determine the buttons, but we are not. So what we have to do there is to let go of this wrong view, and then we are free. Now how do we let go? Just till the end of this. But how do we let go? This is the another the picture of the stream of consciousness, input state action, next input, next state, next action, etc. And you have a dynamical system. And there is a picture of a dynamical system. But with meditation, you restrict input. You close your eyes, you are in a quiet room. So hardly any input. You don't move, hardly any output. So the only thing you see is the change of S's, of states. And since there are only relatively few states, you will see at some point that you're walking in a circle. Now, if you have walked three times in a circle, like in a chess game, if you're three times the same position, then you stop the game. You step out. And this is um, the reset or cessation, and that gives you the essential uh, de-automatization that brings you peace. So I have hope that I have shown that the Abhidhamma Turing model uh, has applications useful for cognitive science even, but also for understanding the soteriological aspect of the path. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hank. So we have um, uh, tw 25 minutes of pause, coffee pause, and then back at 4 o'clock precisely.